Good evening, everyone. Yang Yan Zhao back again tonight. We have one of the more interesting finds of the recent indie comic scene. A man who draws like the 90s, <laughs> but has stories more appropriate for modern day. And I don't mean updated for modern audiences. I mean modern day stories. <laughs> yeah. We have Joe Sontag. Thanks for coming. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. Uh, to everybody out there, just you know, I'm getting over being sick, so my voice might be just you know a little hoarse or up and down or whatever. Just just so you know, I'm doing my best, but I'm glad to be here. So, uh, your your biggest claim to fame at the moment is your Indiegogo for Reaper Destroyer, uh, and I, I first saw this uh, I think before you launched a few years ago, and I wanted to have you on the show at the time, but I, I sort of disappeared for a year but <laughs> one thing that uh, i've always wanted to know is what made you decide to get started um doing comics i mean <clears throat> most people that follow my channel or follow me know that i was i've, I was all, I've always been into comics since i was a kid i got into comics around eight ten years old um and i I just always wanted to be a, a comic artist, you know, like I wanted to, my original dream was to kind of grow up and to uh, draw for image. One of the studios, whether it was extreme wild storm, top cow, you know, like I was just so in love with in image comics because all my favorite uh, artists went from Marvel to image, you know, like that was just, that was where the excitement was. That's where I wanted to be. So I spent most of my teen years <clears throat> learning how to draw as best as I could. And, uh, it was, you know, that was just my determination. So, I mean, I, I got my portfolio together. Together, I went into <clears throat> conventions as soon as I was old enough to do so, showing my work around, you know, trying to get a job, get picked up like everyone says. And, that, you know, at that point, you quickly find out it's a, it's kind of a who you know business, not so much how good you are or, or your potential for being good. And at that point, I was like, well, you know, maybe the best, you know, way for me to break into the industry is uh independently make my own book you know i, I watch a lot of people throughout the 90s have their own independent books like billy tushi was she you know mm -hmm. um a lot of examples so i decided like i'm gonna make my own character and i'm gonna do my own book i'm gonna try to break in that way because <clears throat> if i if i can get into the industry maybe i can get noticed and, and you know picked up by somebody uh so i mean that was that was kind of always where it went from and you know, that that went on for a couple of years uh, and then, you know, circumstances in life led me down a different path for a while. I, I joined a band and got into music, did that for a decade and then I uh, came back to back to my first love, which is art. And um, once I figured out that the industry had changed and that was the biggest thing, like, you know, being gone for 10 years, you didn't see a lot of the change in the industry. And I'm talking specifically about like the political stuff that, that came in and <clears throat> and changed what comics were to me. Um, I come back, I'm looking at it. I'm trying to break into the industry. I'm trying to get my, my art chops back up. And my friend, my co-host, Sean Aaron, who is uh, my co-host on Ott and Stuff on Thursdays and my co-host on Appreciating Comic Book Art Live on Tuesdays, told me uh, about this thing that was happening with crowdfunding and specifically with Comicsgate, which I'd never heard of. And I started looking into it and I started to kind of look at the success that some of the people were having both people that had names in the industry and people that also didn't have names in the industry were first timers coming up. And he, Sean basically told me, he's like, dude, he's like, why don't you dust off Reaper destroyer, which is what I tried to break. You know, I tried to do that in the early two thousands, mid two thousands. He's like, uh, you know, dust it off and bring it back. He's like, I think it'd be successful. So I always have to give a shout out to Sean. Cause he always reminds me. He's like, don't forget. He's like, I'm the one that I'm the reason why Reaper destroyer is here. I'm like, okay. So shout out to you, Sean. It's definitely it's on you, brother. I, I appreciate it. And I love you. Um, but you know, that kind of brought me full circle back to uh developing Reaper Destroyer and getting it out there and launching it on this thing we call crowdfunding now, which is the only way I could really do it. And you know, fortunately for me, it hit at the right time with the right excitement and, and did fairly well right out the gate. Um, so you know, looking at your work, uh a lot of it reminds me sort of of classic Mark Silvestri. Uh, who were your drawing influences back in the day? I mean, you nailed it on that with the Silvestri stuff. Uh, Silvestri is probably, <clears throat> excuse me, more of my current uh, influence going back probably the last 15 or so years. Uh, but ultimately, like, I have so many different artists that I fell in love with over the years. 
and you'll gravitate it to what they did in their style. Uh, starting out with like uh, Tom McFarlane and Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld. Those are the first three guys right out the gate that I was trying to draw like. I was trying to draw like Jim Lee the most. He was my favorite artist for the long, longest time. And I discovered people like, you know, Dale Keown. And that switched up like what I wanted to draw certain things, you know. So I'd start adding stuff from what I saw him do. You know, Stephen Platt was the same way. I liked a lot of the, the detail rendering that Platt would do. And I'd try to start putting that into my style. And uh, you could name any artist in the 90s that was big. You know, I, I could go down the list. And it was at one point or another, I was just like, that was my favorite artist. Then this guy's my favorite artist. And this guy's my favorite artist. And I just kind of bounced back and forth between artists until I landed on Silvestri who I'd always known and I'd always followed, but there was something with like the darkness, the darkness era that Silvestri did that really grabbed me with his art. Like there's just something about the, the sharp lines he would do uh, thin paneling and, and the way he paneled his stuff as well within, within the book itself that just really I gravitated to Silvestri. And I've pretty much been, you know, a big follower of Silvestri has ever since. So my stuff does have a Silvestri feel. I could never draw like him. The dude's, the dude's the goat. You know, he's one of the best comic artists of all time. So there's no, yeah, absolutely no way i'm getting into that stratosphere but there are definitely Silvestri isms you know you could say that are in my style that i've adopted um specifically with like a lot of the top cow artists that came out too like finch and turner and all those guys but yeah there's just i mean the list is crazy as far as influences and i think that's good for developing a style and becoming the best artist you can be is just take as much from everybody that you can take and then see you know see what it comes out see what your style becomes yeah absolutely uh, and in some ways, I'm kind of surprised uh, that you were such a Silvestri fan just because he sort of seems like one of the the looked over guys from that era. Highly, um, he's underrated. Well, oh, yeah, he's highly underrated for that era because, you know, the big three guys, McFarlane, uh, Lee and Lightbelt, they just caught fire. Right. Probably because mostly the X books and, you know, Spider-Man, obviously, mm -hmm. and then. Liefeld, you know, just reinventing new mutants and creating X Force and dropping all these awesome characters that just fit the 90s, right? Deadpool, Cable. Yeah. They were 90s characters, right? Like just boom, they hit. And so they got a lot of uh, a lot of the stardom. I think Silvestri being around for a while, he was kind of doing the house style. He had his style. Like you can go back to Uncanny X Men and you can go to Wolverine. Very good work. I really enjoy it. Uh, but it is kind of very much just like the way that Marvel would draw, like kind of the old school, because he was older than the other guys, you know. And I think once he started to see what his what his counterpoint parts were doing at Image, how they would panel, how they break panels, how they do the big splashy in your face stuff. I think he saw it and he got it. Once he started doing that, you could just boom, he exploded because you could just see the the skill that he was. I mean, he was a better penciler than all those guys. And I think they'll all admit it. You know, I think that's not even a controversial thing to say, but I think it's getting that formula that was so exciting in the 90s. Because you think about old school storytelling, very grid, very panel grid, you know, standard kind of thing. It wasn't a lot of crazy uh, storytelling, a lot of paneling and stuff that kind of made you think. And these guys came in and kind of reinvented the Western comic feel of how you tell a story and how you can you know, break the rules, so to speak. And it made comics interesting at that time for the younger generation, which is what I was, you know, in that in that moment in time. And Silvestri hadn't got there yet. But when he did, I mean, he took off. And you see it. You see it in his work, and you saw it just going on. Uh, so, yeah, highly underrated in the 90s. But I think he's become more appreciated, i say, over the last 20, 25 years, you know, maybe 20 years especially, you know, into the 2000s for sure. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. He's he's like, um, you know, you look at movies like The Thing, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, there were utter failures yeah. in the box office, and now they're considered cult classics. Right, uh, there you go. I kind of look at his, well, <coughs> even, even his X-Men and Wolverine runs, um, you know, to me, were, were that way. And yeah, uh, something happened where uh, those, you know, uh, Liefeld, uh, McFarlane, and Lee, uh, for some reason, they just took off at an astronomic rate. I mean, they're fantastic. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I kind of agree with you. I think uh, Silvestri was a better draftsman, for sure. I think, in some cases, you look at, like, Jim Lee benefited very much from Scott Williams. You know, yeah. Scott Williams was a little bit more of a seasoned inker, so a younger artist can kind of come in and, and learn from a seasoned inker, and, and they combined very well. And so the style you saw Jim Lee 
was also part style of Scott Williams. So they mesh very well and they just, they were great. You know, like probably yep. one of the best duos in, in history. And they, they absolutely did amazing work <clears throat> in uncanny and X-Men and then everything else they've done in their career. Uh, Tom McFarlane, when he started inking himself, he had just kind of this, such a style that, that stuck out and it grabbed you, you know, just the way he inked himself, the way he drew is just so different than most of the stuff that was going on that day. So he stood out. And mm-hmm. Liefeld, I was just talking to somebody about this online earlier today. Liefeld just had this this style that just grabbed you. Like there was something about his style. Like yeah, he might not have been as accomplished or technically as um, polished as guys like uh, Jim Lee were, but yeah. there was something about his his work that was just pure energy. You know the way he posed characters, the way he drew action, and just the dynamics and everything. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why those guys really jumped up. When you look at Sylvester. He did good stuff in Uncanny and in, in Wolverine. I don't think that he worked with inkers that really truly understood what he was trying to do. And I say that because I had a conversation with one of his inkers at Top Cow, uh, Matt Banning. A lot of people, Matt Bat Banning, if you guys remember the name, um, who did some work in my book, uh, by the way. And he was just kind of telling me we had this long conversation about Sylvester. And he said that it, when he took over Ink and Sylvester, like he he kind of understood what Sylvester was trying to do with his line work and how it was being rendered. And he he kind of thought it was like nobody had really inked him except for Scott Williams well up until the point that he took over because he could see what Sylvester was trying to accomplish and how to bring that out better than some of the other inkers. And I think he's absolutely true because you can see when those two guys got together, Sylvester's art, you know, not that he needed it. This is not a, a slight against Sylvester at all. But when you're working with an inker, uh, it doesn't matter how good of an artist you are. A, 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 either a bad inker or an inker that doesn't really get you can bring your work down. It, it doesn't make you shine as 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 well as it should. Work with a really good inker that gets you and you mesh well together, then it's going to strengthen all of the stuff that you put down on paper and bring it out the way it should look, and it should look awesome. Scott Williams, Jim Lee, perfect example. Matt Bat Banning and Mark Sylvester get together, and that was kind of the same thing. Like they clicked. Like they they were able to do great work together, and that included of the darkness and then uh, so on. And then, you know, Joe Weems came into the picture and I think Sylvester just kind of, he took notice. People started to notice his stuff more and that's all he really needed is just somebody to notice. Cause he was getting out, yeah. you know, he was getting shadowed. You know, he's in the shadow of the big three, you know, like there was image. Yeah. There was the big seven of image, but of those image guys, there was the big three, you know, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's funny. You say that uh, Dan green was his inker pretty much all the way through Marvel. Right. And- yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to think that Dan really did Mark dirty uh, in that, you know, it, it really wasn't living up to its potential, but I don't know. Now, now I kind of, I kind of rethink that, um, you know, because there, there was like such a specific look yeah. uh, from that time. That was, that was very different than like uh, either sort of the John Byrne, JRJR styles that came before or uh, the Jim Lee stuff that came after. Yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, speaking of music terms, like uh, a band like the White Stripes, everyone complains that uh, Meg White was a terrible drummer. And it's like, <sighs> yeah, but the music wouldn't have sounded like that if you had a more technical drummer. True. You know, true, so true. There's, I don't know. Yeah. But, I think yeah. Uh, with Dan Green, <laughs> and I think he might have worked with Farmer for a little bit too with some of the stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> What I really think it is, is one, I don't know if they meshed very well, but I honestly think if you if you look back on how uh, penciling was done in like, let's say the 80s or in further back, a lot of times because you're on such a heavy deadline. And I think Uncanny was coming out like uh, twice a month at yeah, that point. It was crazy. So I'm thinking more than anything, you saw a lot of Sylvester putting down on paper what needed to be there to tell the story. And mm-hmm. then you know, so you're talking about loose penciling. Not everything is so nice and, and tightened and, and, and detailed out. It's a little bit more loose. And then the inker's got to come along and tighten it all together and make it a finished product, uh, which is kind of the way you used to do it back in the day. <clears throat> and I think maybe it's just the deadline suffered to the point where Sylvester wasn't shining the way that he did like later on in the 90s when he had time to actually put into his art as, fo- as, as opposed to just I mean, granted, that paycheck for X-Men, Uncanny X-Men was paying. You know, those royalties were coming down. He's pumping that stuff out. Issue after issue is coming out. 
do it, man. Make that money. But I think like once the 90s hit and it became this pop culture sensation and it became all about the art, which before it was like, you know, the stories and everything, you know, like the writing was was king as the characters. But the 90s was about the art. The artist was king yeah. in the 90s. And when that happened, I think Silvestri saw what the other guys were doing and then basically, for better, better lack of word, uh, copied what he was what they were doing as far as like process and everything. And I think you really saw like how much he shined and how talented he was compared to everybody else. Like he could do what everybody else could do and then he could do it better. You know, and you saw that in the late nineties. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I'm just thinking back a little bit about if you, if you think about the X-Men covers from those times, like for sure. So Estri is going to be, uh overrepresented in how iconic those covers ended up overall oh, yeah. you know not to not to jim lee had some great covers as well sure, sure but sure. uh but i think that mark's run and it was quite a long run uh like just if you think back to those times like a lot of his covers you know wolverine on the cross oh yeah that's yeah one of the best it's still one of the best covers I mean, a lot of his Wolverine covers were great, too. You look at oh, his yeah. run on Wolverine. I mean, a lot of those covers were just fantastic. So, I mean, he he always had that, you know. I just think that comics were different uh, yeah. pre-90s. They were just different. They were different on how you approached it, how you drew it. And then the 90s hit, and it was just a, it was a different era. The focus was on the art. You see a lot more guys drawing more, you know, more and more tight, more detail, you know, just crazier and crazier stuff, pushing the limits. And I think once Mark got into that rhythm and understood that that's what was happening, what was going on, you saw him just, you know, completely take off. And I mean, the dude can't be touched, you know, in my opinion, he yeah. absolutely cannot be touched by his peers. Uh, so, and on Reaper Destroyer, here we go. Uh, I was looking over the, um, over the Indiegogo, uh, a little bit earlier. And one thing struck me, which is all the names. Now I, I can't remember if it was on your art station account or if it was on uh deviant art, but it was a post from several years ago. And you say, I do pencils and I haven't yet found someone who uh, I haven't yet found an inker that works really well with my style. Um, and I see on this Indiegogo right here, you have several of the top mm -hmm. inkers. Uh, you've got Bat Banning. Um, who else we got here? Uh, Weems. Weems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, what does it do? How how does working with uh, like a pro inker change change your art either for the better or the worse? Or, or how does it work for you working with them? It was amazing. Like I learned so much. It's funny to bring bring up that post because I, I completely forgot about it until now. I think that was probably Deviant Art. You know, I can't remember. It's been so long, but I do know there was a period of time where I hadn't got up to uh, the skill of inking my own stuff, and I was I was looking for somebody that I could work with. Because no offense, but people like me that are amateurs, they they don't really know how to ink properly. Uh, inking is such a, a skill that needs to be learned. Uh, because you can butcher somebody's art really easily if you don't working with professionals that know how to add line weight, uh, know how to uh, correct certain little mistakes that might be in your art is uh, it's a huge benefit, especially when you're working with legends like Joe Weems and Matt Bat Banning. Uh, even Marlo Aquiza uh, from Extreme Studios working with him uh, was was a treat, you know, because you can you can draw. What I did is I, I would draw my pencils on on the comic board, and then I would send that that original board to them, and they just ink right over my pencils, and then I would get it back. So it was cool to be able to look at their ink <clears throat> ink lines over my original work, and I could tell like what what did they add, you know, how did they uh, make this look better, you know, what was their technique with this uh, cross hatching I was trying to do, you know, like on the shoulder or something. I was trying to do something specifically, and I would do it the best I could. And then I watched how they went in and they just made it right. You know, like how they did it more right. And uh, so I learned a lot just from watching those guys ink my work. And my inking took a step up because of that, because I could see what they were doing. I would study how I looked through their their eyes. And what's cool about a professional inker 
is they will they will keep your core style. So anybody could look at your work and be like, oh, that's Joe's work. That is Joe's art for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they know how to just tweak it just enough to make it look better. And that's what an inker should do. Take that original work, finish it out, make it that much better to the point where it really just has that finished uh, look. Those are the best inkers I've, I've ever worked with and probably ever will work, work with. Um, I've worked with a lot of, of great inkers on this project, including Chance Wolf. And uh, I worked with a couple younger guys, too. They're coming up uh, in uh, Corey King, who does some work on uh, Gunslinger Spawn. He's filled in a couple of uh, pages here, there. And uh, Matthew Seaborn, who's uh, just an amateur guy, but I, I really like the stuff. Like, he should be working in the industry, so I wanted to work with him. Um, so I learned a lot from everybody. And going forward, I'm probably going to handle the majority of the inking myself because I really I improved to the point where I really enjoyed doing it. I liked seeing how it was looking. Plus, there are so many different things you can do when you ink than you can do when you pencil as far as, like, effects or just different yeah. uh, different line work you can do. And I really started to fall in love with the different styles of inking because there's so many different styles of inking out there besides just the tools with brush and, and, and nib <clears throat> or pens. There's so many different things you could do. One of the biggest things that inspired me was watching Silvestri's rise and how his style uh, changed over time. You know, it never went back. It kept getting better. But you could see like his influences, how he would go from like the really sharp, clean work of the 90s and then go into a little bit more of the sketchy, kind of write some work that he's kind of doing now right yeah and so studying his work you know just seeing like well how can you be a little bit more loose with your lines and a little bit more <clears throat> sketchy sometimes to keep the energy and bring that out as opposed to always being very sharp uh finished perfectly looking you know like how can you add that into your work to make it to make it stand out to give something more to to your to your your uh, your your uh, pencils and so once I started experimenting with that, it, it really took me in a different direction. So, but yeah, short, long answer for the question is that it was immensely important to be able to work with those guys and just see seasoned inkers over my work. Is that, um, is having a separate inker something that you would recommend for other uh, people who maybe are doing their first book? Um, because of course it's going to add a lot of expense to that title. However, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but there are certain problems I see general problems for the indie community. And one of them is, uh, to me, seems like pencils are okay, but when people ink themselves, sometimes like it doesn't like they could use somebody else to, to sort of pick up, like, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? And then oh, yeah. the strengths and, and downplay the weaknesses. <clears throat> that's the that's the positive with working with an inker that knows what they're doing is they again they will they will add stuff to your art and they will they will fix the little things that need to be fixed um i will never look as good as when bat or weems or marlo are inking me because they ink in their style they ink with all those years of experience that's the best i'm going to look um that doesn't take away from anybody else or from what i'm doing but if you want to look your absolute best, and this is the secret, it's not really that big of a secret. All the guys that we loved coming up worked with great inkers, and you saw the combination of those two together, and that was the final art. We gave all of the the props to the penciler, right? Because you see Jim Lee, you see that finished work, and you're just like, oh, Jim Lee, Jim Lee's so awesome, blah, 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 you know, year after year, and he is, he's great. But once you start realizing what that inker does, then you kind of go back and you, you start giving some of the credit also to the inker. Be like, you know, that combination, Jim Lee and Scott Williams, man, they're awesome, you know, kind of thing. And I think if you get a chance to work with a professional or just somebody that knows what they're doing uh, to enhance your work, <clears throat> do it because it's only going to look better. And that's the whole purpose yeah. of making comics is to, to make it look as, as best you, you can look. If you're confident in what you're doing, then by all means, go ahead and ink yourself. And there's so many different styles out there. Um, of, of art of, of of pencilers of inkers that if you just if if you can make it look good and professional i think you're going to be okay but if you're going for a specific look <clears throat> and you can't accomplish that on your own as far as inks go definitely look into spending a little bit of money and see if you can get a an accomplished professional uh, inker to come in and you know put ink over your lines hmm. so you know one other uh thing I, i've been wondering in general i've had a few inkers on and I've had a chance uh, to ask them, do you think inking is sort of going away in the industry in general? 
uh, because I see a lot of books from Marvel and DC and they look like coloring books to me. Like there's very little to no hatching, uh, yeah. the quality of the line, like there's no differentiation in line weight. Um, do you, do you see like either that going away? Um, because there's like an over-reliance on <laughs> the colorist to provide the volume. Or do you think yeah. maybe we're going to go to like a two-tiered system where you have like prestige books that go like full Bernie Wrightson, uh, crazy inking, and then like a, a sort of bottom tier, which is like the standard that has no inking or virtually no inking? <clears throat> I mean, as far as, as the inkers go, I mean, inkers have been an under attack, so to speak, ever since like the early 2000s or whatever whatever time that that happened when everyone was starting to go the really tight pencils and then just skip the anchor and go right to colors i know turner did it with uh steigerwald they made a really good combination together steigerwald was was a great colorist it could make up for the lack of anchor but turner was also really tight and in turner's work he had line weight variation and he was just a very good accomplished draftsman so there wasn't a lot missing and i think that kind of it hurt inkers in a way where a lot of people were saying, one, I can save money, right? On a project, I don't have to pay the anchor now if we just skip that and I can just take my pencils right to color. So you're saving money on a project. I think uh, comic book art looks best when it's inked. To me, that's just comic book art, you know, like pencils, inks, colors. That, that makes comic book uh, art correct in my way. I think inkers are very important because they add so much to the art that might not be seen by the the reader but <laughs> it wouldn't be the same without it you know like there's watching the guys that worked out over my my pencils seeing what they did you know changed my my perspective on inking has been this way for a while so it's not just that 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 made me respect inkers for so much like i've respected the inkers role in comics and in art for a long long time but seeing it up close in person for the first time really like kind of solidified that that it's a collaboration, right? So I can draw as best as I can draw. And then I work with a good inker that gets me that knows how to finish. They're artists themselves. You know, a lot of inkers are artists themselves. Mm -hmm. They just for some reason didn't get the, the, you know, the artist gig, but they're very good inkers themselves. So they can take that. And then it's a collaborative effort to make it look as best as it absolutely can. When you take an inker out of that, basically it's just you. So then you have to be really good, right? You either have to be really, really good at drawing pencils and tight and so that you can go straight to colors or you have to be good or stylized as an inker yourself to the point where you can you know do your own work but if i ever get a chance to work with a really talented inker that can uh bring my stuff out even better than what i'm doing i'm down to do it because i'm i'm a faster penciler than i am an inker i would much rather work on a book where i had a solid inker the problem is finding a solid inker and so i'll say this as far as uh advice and kind of the problems I ran into um, when I got bat and I got weems on the book, it was, it was a dream come true. Like it, I couldn't believe I was working with these legends on the book. Uh, the problem is that when they're taking indie work, you know, that doesn't, um, that doesn't really pay the bills, right? Like they're still taking money from wherever commissions jobs, because they're, they're, they're hooked up. They got, they got contacts. People are calling them all the time. Like, Hey, you want to jump on this project? You want to do this, you know, and they're going to do it. You know, so being able to actually find an inker of that caliber to stay in a book for the entire book is going to be damn near impossible. So just keep that in mind when you're going after some of the top names. And that's just something I found out, you know, like I was hoping they would do the entire book. It didn't turn out that way. That's why I ended up having, you know, I think five inkers on the book, including myself. You know, one thing I learned the second book around, I'm, I'm either doing the entire inks myself or we're just, just going to be me and another guy. And that's yeah. it. Um just just for the headache so it's just something i learned i'll pass on to any, anybody out there that might be thinking of doing the same thing but uh you get what you pay for i'll say that these guys they cost money but they're gonna make your shit look awesome definitely so getting back to uh reaper destroyer give us give us the lowdown <clears throat> well, i say this i say this a lot of times when i'm i'm, I'm talking about this book there is a, a certain amount of mystery that's that's surrounded in the first issue that I have a tendency to kind of wander into uh, spoiler territory. So basically, I'll just say it's it's about a, a guy that's imprisoned in a supernatural suit of armor that's inhabited by the ancient spirit of death who's trying to possess his soul. Uh, that's the, the point of the book. Everything else that follows in the book, 
so a lot of mystery involved into what their purpose is, uh, who imprisoned them in the armor, and uh, what their ultimate uh, goal is going to be. And once the first issue is out, we can actually talk about the story because I try to put it in a way that everything that needs to be known is going to be in the first issue and set up the next issue because this is very much a, it's a serial. It's an ongoing um, series of books I'm doing, just story arc after story arc uh, format wise. So it's not a one and done um, graphic novel and then move on. So this this is a very much you know classic way because that's what I, I grew up uh, loving was a very uh, classic version of the first issue. You know, we're doing character introduction. We're giving you a story. We're going to give you some badass action. And then we're going to set it up for issue two. And we're going to keep on expanding the story. So once issue one comes out, we can talk way more about the story because some of the uh, mystery that's wrapped up in issue one and uh, reveals, I'll say, uh, will be out there in the open. So speaking of action, uh, you know, as a guy who is a fan of 90s action, um, probably I'm going to guess a little bit of late eighties, uh, once they started switching over to more of a 90s style, yeah. what makes a good action scene in comics? Uh, well, to me, I think it's, and I always come from just the art point of view on it, but I think it's just, uh, dynamic, uh, camera angles, uh, and ways you can, uh, stage the fight scene right uh what what can you do as far as where we can put the characters in different positions to make it uh visually entertaining to see especially in, in characters where you're just doing like uh fisticuffs right you're just punching mm -hmm. back and forth or kicking uh that's just not going to be enough in a regular fight scene because it's just it's going to be kind of be kind of boring right so you, you're going to have to actually draw it in a way that's that's very exciting one way you can do that you can keep energy with uh speed lines you know things that show impact you know draw different uh angles to show the the weight of the character as they're punching or as they're coming after somebody uh the impact of a character as they're they're being hit or thrown aside uh try to keep the dialogue down too like dialogue is fine in in fight scenes <clears throat> i see some people say there should be no dialogue uh there can be too much dialogue i think if you have the right amount of dialogue in a fight scene the the reader isn't just going to be get bored of seeing just panel after panel after panel because not everybody's going to love uh, just the art like i do you know i could be right. completely fine with that some people want you know what's progressing the story uh so yeah i mean with the way i look at fight scenes is much like uh the action movies of the 80s and 90s you know like how well can you you stage the scene and keep it entertaining you know beat after beat after beat you know is it moving along is it keeping you into the intensity of that fight scene if you're doing that then you're doing something good counter to that a lot of like current books right you know where you're having a fight scene and there's just like this chunk of dialogue that you have to read where the characters are having this unrealistic conversation about you know pronouns or something like that that's yeah. the wrong way to do it i'd say right off the bat like that's you're probably not going to get too many uh, readers doing that uh how realistic do you think an artist should be like for example um should should you like know a little bit about boxing or some sort of martial art and like try to throw a little bit more realism in there or um or, or how do you approach it? it it all depends on what you're going for i mean if you have a character specifically that has those attributes in fighting then sure you do a little research on on uh, fighting and how a fighting style is if that's all it's going to be you know uh the way i look at it is a little bit more using the imagination is kind of taking mm -hmm. all of uh, what you've seen in cinema over the years, whether it's gunfights and, you know, martial arts or just whatever, all the action movies. And that's kind of what I just kind of go back to is like the action movies. Like, how do they do stuff? They just made things look cool. You know, unless it was like a Kung Fu movie where specifically, you know, you're watching a guy do a bunch of technical fighting. You know, if you're watching Schwarzenegger or, you know, uh, whoever you know just in a fight scene they're just they're kind of brawling and every once in a while you see a a kick or something you know i kind of I, I think it's the safest way to do a fight scene unless you want to specifically draw out how somebody blocks a punch or how somebody can counter this or counter that i think the problem with that is you can get a little too technical technical and it kind of gets boring uh because you can only draw certain things in a certain way and you only have so much space to draw something so are you going to spend you know one or one two or three panels on showing somebody going to punch and then doing a block and doing a specific move and doing you know you just wasted 
you know, half a page or whatever on one specific fight scene when you could just ball it all together and just, you know, show multiple different angles of impacts and, and punches and all that kind of stuff. So really whatever you want to do, if you can do it well, go for it. Me, I just kind of, I wing it and just try to draw what looks cool. But then again, I have have a lot of monsters and stuff. So I'm not, you know, my, my characters are monsters, you know, a dude finding a bunch of monsters. So that makes it a little easier with how, well, with how he fights. So, um, (laughs) <laughs> in, you know in old like through the 80s let's say uh, a lot of comic books like a fight scene would be like maybe two pages at yeah. most um and then i've seen like some manga where it's like an entire issue is just one fight scene yes. do you have any like sort of preferred um length like do, does the fight scene get a little stale if it goes on for too long or it how can. do you- it, it depends on what the purpose of the fight scene is um so if you were doing pacing in a book and you're you're, you know like how long do you want to focus on this scene you know is it is it an important part of the story to the point where we can really extend this out are we learning something in the fight scene about the character or about the story if that's the case and you could do it as long as you want it you know like like you said i don't read a lot of manga but you could have an entire book that's just a fight scene two people going at it or somebody mm-hmm. going at, at it with a bunch of different people but somehow you're still getting story you're advancing the plot if you can do that then go for it uh if it's just like so in reaper destroyer the the book starts out with a fight scene and it's basically just to kind of i've always had a philosophy of if you're going to read a book as a first time reader you want something that's going to grab somebody right away uh i'm not going to do a you know six pages of just build up because a certain person might look at that and be like, ah, I'm not really reading it. I'm not into it. You know, I'm going to put it back down. But if you pick it up and right off the bat, you're like, boom, you're in the middle of something. You're seeing some cool art. You're seeing your know, action. For me, that draws me in, right? And so the beginning fight scene is more of just an introduction. So it's not very long of a fight scene. I think it's like five pages, which seems long, but it's not really all fighting. It's just the entire scene is that. And later on in the book, there's a much more significant battle that kind of moves the story along you know reveals some things fills you know fills some clues in all this kind of stuff all while the fighting is happening and that's much more of a a significant bigger fight bigger splash pages that kind of stuff you're more in your face because it's more impactful so i think if you do it that way uh you could do as many pages as you want but just make sure that it's benefiting the story and not just because you want to draw a bunch of fighting you know that is the most fun stuff to do don't get me wrong, <laughs> but there has to be a reason why we're fighting and why is the fight taking this long, you know? Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> Fabrizio Aiello asks, any favorite anatomy or drawing books? Uh, you know, not really. I picked up a lot of my, you know, I mean, How to Draw the Marvel Way is always a good book. I, I owned it. But to me personally, like, I always got more, um, I got better at drawing by just, looking at art and trying to accomplish it it might not have been the best way to go about it you know because i had to relearn a lot of uh fundamentals later on that i never learned when i was younger so a lot of books can be good for that but if you can find stuff online youtube is great there's so many drawing streams on youtube instrument instrumentals instructionals and stuff like that that visually i learn more by watching somebody actually do it than watching and reading a book with you know, examples to see. So if, if I can watch just Silvestri do a, a con sketch and see how he forms a character, how he forms faces, you know, how he, where he, how he draws the eyes and the nose and all this kind of stuff. Watch Jim Lee. He's got a million videos out there of him drawing. Um, and you can kind of see like how they do it, you know, how, how their flow is, how their structure is. That was more beneficial to me than any book. So I guess to each their own. That's just how I learned. Um, so getting back to, uh, Reaper destroyer, uh, now it, uh, the initial campaign was back in, uh, 2022. Yes. Um, how is progress on the book going? Good. All the art is done. Um, the colors are done. We just have to go through me and my colors need to sit down on uh, the next couple of days, hopefully coming up and just make sure that everything uh, flows the way it needs to fix minor mm-hmm. stuff needs to be fixed before we can move on with that. I have uh, one more page to 
<clears throat> script as far as the dialogue. And then I can kind of send that to my editor and get feedback and notes before we can actually move along to the actual uh, lettering of the book. But it's damn close. Uh, it took a little bit longer than I thought I was going to. I, w- I always wanted to get it done by July of, of, of last year was my goal. And for whatever reason, one reason or another, some some had to do with uh, certain people in the project uh, either left or had to be let go. And you had to replace those people. It's just part of the game. And then uh, my dad started getting sick or the tail end of last year and you know, spent some time in the hospital, too, which really slowed down a lot of my um, uh, progress on the book because I, I took a lot of time off to uh, be with him in that situation so we are where we are uh but we are getting close to the the finish line here closer than we ever are so uh to anybody watching out there yes i mean pretty much the the book is done the supplemental is done we're just into the next phase of making sure everything is good before we actually put things to print because you know want to make sure that you know we got an editor on the book mark polton is editing the book it's good to have an editor we want to make sure this thing comes out as professional as possible so we don't want typos you know, misspellings, all that kind of stuff that people can, you know, just kill you over once they actually spend the money for the book and get it. So we're going to make sure this is the best it can be before we put it in your hands. So then if people are still interested in this issue, there's still time to back now before it delivers. Oh, absolutely. I was <clears throat> I was actually going to close the campaign down. And I think it was actually right before my dad got sick. <clears throat> I was like, man, we're getting close. We should close down the campaign just so everybody knows that like hey we're we're right there let's let's draw up the excitement and let's close it down and then we'll we'll get the books out and uh i had a good friend of mine rick sailor who is uh is a huge backer of a lot of campaigns and he hit me up he's like dude are you crazy <laughs> he's like don't shut down the campaign he's like keep it open as long as you can he's like you know you always want to get as many backers as you can he's like keep it open until you start sh- you know shipping and he's like if you want to close it down close it down then so i i ran a uh I asked my chat about it on one of my shows and the consensus was to leave it open and everybody kind of understood what was going on. And especially when my dad got sick, you know, people have been really good as long as you're transparent with everybody. Mm-hmm. They seem to be very good with, you know, what's going on. I try to be as transparent as possible and let people know exactly what's going on in the book and where we're at. So we're leaving it open until uh, probably until I ship or get close to being done shipping. Uh, so there'll be time for people to get it. Uh, we, the only thing that might, we might do is close down some of the tiers the okay. closer we get. Like, so I have a ton of different tiers, ton of different combinations you can get different covers, uh, you know, like all that kind of stuff. People, you know, if you're interested, go, go through the campaign. I won't bore you with all the stuff we have on the campaign, but at some point, some of those will be shut down to the point where you can only get like the main cover or something like that. Just so we're not to, you know, because at some point we have to have enough, we have to have the numbers. I'm going to overprint a lot of books, but, you know, like I need to start having a better idea of, of the numbers before I start fulfilling. So I don't want somebody coming in and getting this tier that's got like all these crazy things. Now I have to account for that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's plenty of time if people are interested in this book to to get it. Uh, I am trying to launch the second issue in uh, May as my ultimate goal. So I'm hoping to ramp things up here and get some excitement for issue two. Uh, and I, I've actually got an idea. And I, I'll reveal this the closer we get, but I've got this a different kind of uh business crowdfund funding model in, in head in my head for the next issues going on and hopefully i make it a little bit cheaper for people um back in the books and than they have been because i know it is a, a pretty big price tag to spend 35 dollars, including shipping for one issue so i'm gonna try to make it cheaper for the the people that come back to get the book the second issue nice um so if anybody's interested right now what tier would you uh, recommend if someone is, you know, maybe they're just getting back into comics and they're like, Oh, that looks like it did in the nineties. What, what tier would you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you have the money, I would, I would say the feature tier is the destroyer tier. And that's just, that comes with everything. Um, so it comes with all, all the variant covers, the Virgin covers If people like to collect Virgin covers, which I do. Um, it's got those in there. The black and white edition is in there. Um, a full foil exclusive ash can is in there. Uh, and then uh, metal cards. There's a ton of stuff in there for two hundred dollars. Nice. It's expensive, granted, but there is a. It's well worth the money putting into, it, and you get absolutely everything we're putting on the campaign. Um, besides that, I see there's a there's a tier on there that has the main book and the supplemental book because we have a supplemental book with backup stories in it as well. 
that just kind of expands the universe, you know, gives some more insight into some of our characters. Uh, I would say grab that is, you know, cause that would just give you, get you those two books. Uh, but if anything, grab my cover, grab Dale's cover or grab Shelby's cover. Those are the three main covers on the book itself. I don't think you can go wrong with either of those, especially this Dale Keown cover right here. I mean, this thing is just, this thing is yeah. just amazing. Amazing. Did he color that himself or? No, no. <clears throat> Joe Chido colored it. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing about that cover is it's the first time that Dale Keown, Joe Chido, and uh, Chance Wolf did uh, work on a single issue since uh, the pit days. That was oh. the last time they worked all together on an, on an issue. And I, I got Dale to kind of do a, uh, a homage to pit number one, which was that big pit face mm -hmm. shot. Uh, but I had to, I was like, do it a little smaller because we have to include the, the hood. Because, you know, if you, if you remember pit number one, it's really close up on his face, you yeah. know, just yeah. gums and teeth and stuff like that. I was like, we need the hood. So he drew it uh, so you could actually just get a headshot. And I went and got Chato to uh, do uh, colors on it and Chance Wolf to do the lettering. And what we did, if you see there, it says first reaping issue, you know, pit one was first ripping issue, you know. So we tried to make it as much of an homage to pit number one with the guys that did pit number one. So I'm very proud of this this cover. It's a dream come true to work with all three of those guys. And Pitt was one of my favorite comics of all time anyway. Oh, nice. Uh, so everyone, uh, if you're interested, there's links in the description and there is a link in the chat uh, pinned to the top of the chat. So you can go by there. Uh, so, you know, before uh, we came on, we were in the green room a little bit. And I'm kind of wondering um, what, what do you think we as an industry need to do to sort of get comics back into people's hands again? Um, there's the, the main, the big three, I include mm -hmm. image there. Um, in yeah. general, their sales are way down. Um, and even if, you know, there's an uptick, it's not like an uptick back to selling 300,000 issues, right. you know, <clears throat> per month. Uh, on one book and it looks like the direct market uh you know is also circling the drain you had mark millar have uh four comic shop owners um talk about their problems uh currently and within one month one of them went out of business oh so, i know that Please. uh yeah the guy from columbus oh so uh everything seems rather precarious do you, do you have any thoughts or ideas of how we sort of get back to, I don't know if we can ever get back to where we were in the eighties or the nineties, but back to yeah. at least a, a point where <clears throat> we aren't 9% of the industry in the U S anymore. I mean, it all sucks when you, when you, when you look at it just in general. Yeah. I don't think you're, you're ever going to reach the heights that comics were in the nineties. Uh, I think that that ship has just sailed for a lot of different reasons um besides just the comic industry uh new generations are coming up and there's other things to entertain them now i mean look at movies look at the technology and special effects now way more than we had in the 90s and the 90s were cutting edge and, and special effects at that time i think there's just the excitement for that is just not there the mainstream is not doing themselves any favors with the political leaning and uh not even sure what that means that that's hurting that's hurting the product a lot because i think you're driving off the the main core buyers that probably are older you know like a lot of the the main guys that came up like you and me reading comics you're like i'm 42 now like we're people in their late 30s late 40s that are the ones that were really dishing out a lot of the money to these stories because they became part of our lives you know it's not just a kid's thing that we stopped reading it's like it was a part of our lives we enjoyed it we followed these characters and when you come in and you kind of disrespect the characters you drive off that market, then you're kind of left with what you're left with right now. Yeah. Uh, that and the the economy, you know, as the economy's up and down, you know, it was good for a good four years there, you know, when Trump was in office. And I don't care, I'm not talking politics, politics or anything, but when gas prices are down and you can get groceries for cheap, you got extra money to go spend on, on things. That's just the way it is. The economy is now a lot more expensive. So people don't have a lot of money to go and crowd you know buy a lot of crowd funds or go to the stores and, and buy a lot of books so i mean <clears throat> i think basically what we can do as creators is drum up as much excitement as 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 we can in the indie scene uh because there's a lot of readers out there that are looking for that like 
Mm -hmm. Reaper Destroyer specifically, when I started showing um, just art, just I started dropping. I was like, hey, I got this comic coming. It's called Reaper Destroyer. Here's here's what the character looks like. Here's some of the art. The biggest thing that I, I got right off the bat where people would, would DM me or they'd leave comments on my posts just saying like, like, yes, like this is what I've been waiting for. This reminds me of Top Cow. This reminds me of Image. This reminds me of why I love comics, you know. And I think I was able to drum up enough excitement for that kind of fan base to where they came out and they supported the book because I, I was giving them something that they had been longing for. We talked a little bit earlier about the art, right, in the industry. Uh, the mainstream art, yeah, there's some good artists out there. Don't, don't get me wrong. But across the board, I'd say a lot of the stuff is uninspired. It's kind of boring. You know, it's not like what yeah. I remember as comic book art, you know. So if you can give that to to people, I think they're going to come out and buy it. If you can give a good character, good character designs, you know, good IPs, people talk about all the time. What was cool about the 90s when we when we were collecting comics? The characters, the way they looked, you know, you just see a character you're like, oh, man, it's badass. Like, I want to buy that book. I want to know about the character. <clears throat> I think that's very important. Um, and then obviously getting the books out and I'm not talking about just getting the books out to backers to back your campaign I'm do enough books to where you can get them into stores. Um, there's plenty of L LCSs that will take independent books. Um, I know you can go through diamond with stuff, uh, whatnot puts out books now, uh, Barnes and Nobles, you know, wherever, if you can get your book out, fulfill it, of course, obviously to the people that pay up front for, for the book, you know, if you can get a version of your books out into the stores then and just kind of show that there is this alternative out there, I think we can drum up some excitement for something other than the mainstream. Will we ever get to the heights of comic, you know, stardom again? I doubt it. But I think there is a path for us to make quality books for years to come and have a significant fan base to to the point where it's going to make it worthwhile for, for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. Um the only thing for me, though, is, you know, talk about um, that kids have choices for for other sort of media and whatnot, which is true. And, and there's definitely a lot more choice than when we were kids. But um, manga is selling pretty well. And that is true. <laughs> you know, there's there's something about the American comic that or or I guess you could say Western comic that yeah. um, and I'm not know. I, other than like, you know, the problems with the big three, I can't necessarily put my finger on why kids would prefer the Japanese stuff over our stuff. You know, even if it's good quality material, there seems to be a preference. And I, I don't know. I think, I think a lot of it, uh, I'm not an expert on it by any means. Um, just a thought. I think a lot of it has to be when you started having programs like uh dragon ball z or sailor moon or stuff like that coming over to the american um tvs in the, the what mid late 90s to yeah. early 2000s i think you you really started to, to develop this kind of culture and it captured a generation and was kind of passed on to a next generation and i think kids can kind of come up now watching those shows still today or e any new that's true version of the manga and they want to see that in a comic book see what was cool about the 90s is you could watch the x-men spider-man batman animated shows and you you want to see that in a comic book then you could go and you could get that in a comic and it was cool yeah. and matched up it was exciting uh i don't think you have that now with the western american comics but <clears throat> even with the movies you can get into a movie and we've talked I and mean, people have talked about this to death but it's, it's a fact when thor came out and people got excited about Thor, if they did, and we'll just use it as an example. And you're like, I want to start learning about Thor. I'm going to go to the comic book store and I want to buy a Thor comic. You go to the store and it wasn't Thor. It was Lady Thor. You know, it didn't it didn't match up. Right. Uh, I think there's a there's a problem with that. There's a problem with the way, you know, if the movie, you know, again, the movies have not been good lately. So if you're not getting the draw in the movies, you're probably not going to get new readers to come in and, and look at at uh, comics. Manga is a little bit different. Anime is off the chart, right? <clears throat> There's a lot of shows out there, whether it's Netflix or you can just uh, buy movies of these different anime and you're going to go to the actual manga to find versions of those and you're going to pretty much be lined up to what that is. So you can enjoy the cartoons, the anime, and then you can go enjoy the comics as well. Um, as far as like, I've heard some people tell me that the storytelling is much better in manga as far as uh, cohesive. 
where yeah american comics seem to sometimes we get convoluted right we're doing relaunches you know, all the time resetting you know multiverses all this kind of stuff in manga i guess you know and people can correct me in the chat there but i guess you're just telling a fluid story from issue one or you know whatever book it is to the current and you're just continually telling the ongoing story of these characters um so i mean that that could be a lot of stuff you know like i don't really know why a manga is so so attractive right now to the younger crowd um my biggest thing is they're just excited about it so find a way how can we get that kind of excitement going for what we're doing um i guess it's still still to be found out you know yeah that's true well uh we are coming up on the hour mark uh and i know you got something to do i don't want to keep you too long but uh, it's just uh, more or less of it being sick i don't know how long my voice is going to go or last before it <laughs> kind of cracks is out uh but uh, for everyone who hasn't at least checked it out go check out reaper destroyer it looks very cool sounds like it's going to be done some point this year um, oh absolutely I, I, I would say we're going to be getting this out in the first quarter of the year oh nice that's yeah, very i mean like i said all we got to do is is get past editing and make sure everything's good to go and then we're we're headed to print so i'm hoping within the next uh couple months we can do that and then start fulfilling and you know who how, however long that takes is however long that takes but i want to get to fulfillment and get books out and start the process as soon as possible so keep an eye out i think it's going to be sooner than people think awesome uh so everyone thanks for watching um i will have another guest next week not quite sure who it's going to be um but check back soon and keep an eye out for empire of the undying sun that is my project. Uh, it is a campaign guide compatible with Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Website is almost done. Just some technical yes. issues. Uh, but keep an eye on the space. Hello. So thanks, everyone. Good night. See you guys. All right.